So, good morning. Um, I hope you're reasonably awake already um, <coughs> after, after the evening and everything. Um, as, as mentioned, my name is Jukka Zitting. Um, I'm a long-time committer in Tika. Uh, I was one of the, the people who, who originally started the project by bringing in um, a number of, of sub-projects from other Apache um, and then uh, external projects that were doing something similar. And then we figured out that, okay, it would make more sense to kind of pull the efforts and try to do, do just one, one thing well instead of many things kind of so-so. So, um, and I've been working on, on Tika uh, ever since. Uh, I was the co-author of, of the Tika in Action book. So kind of over the years, I've kind of had a chance to do some, some interesting things with Tika, uh, and kind of go around the code base and then trying new things and, and, and so on. So um, this is not going to be a kind of a generic introduction to Tika. Uh, Nick is going to give that later uh, this afternoon. This is more about the kind of things you don't really hear about in the introductions, things that are kind of used in, in, in odd use cases, something that it, you might come across or then you might not come across. So um, there's no kind of a grand, really grand theme to these, these topics. It's more of a, just a collection of, of ideas and, 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 and things you can do with Tika um, or you could uh, bend Tika to, to, to achieve. Um, so uh, I've collected a couple of, of, of topics here that I'm going to go, go through. Um, and if something is, is unclear, if you want to have something clarified, just, just let me know and then we'll dig a little bit deeper into that. Uh, hopefully we'll also have some time at the end for, for questions um, on, 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 on topics that, that you might be wondering that, but that I didn't really really cover here or, or didn't cover in, in enough detail to, to answer all your questions. So um, let's start with um, um, detection. Um, that's typically what, what Tika does when it tar starts uh, <clears throat> dealing with, with the new, new input document. It tries to detect what kind of a document this is. Um, and there's a quite a lot of, of, of rules for detecting different types of binaries, um, but not that many of if you're just try to try to detect a text file. It's actually one of the most complicated things to detect automatically uh, because there are so many different encodings uh, for, for text, plain text, and there, there's typically um, no easy way to determine uh, like automatically of what, what this encoding is. And in, in the generic case, it's even impossible unless you really know, understand the documents, read them through, and, and, and so on. So um, currently, Tika only detects reasonably accurately uh, UTF-8 and, um, and, and the, the, the couple of ASCII-based uh, uh, encodings, uh, including the, the ISO uh, 8859 that's used for for Western European languages, uh, mostly. So, um, so those are reasonably well supported. The other ones, not that much. Uh, if we have, a, have an encoding that has a byte order mark like UTF-16, then it's easy to detect the byte order mark and then be reasonably certain that, OK, this is, this is the, the, the encoding here. But then there's a huge amount of different encodings. There are hundreds of the encodings for all sorts of different languages and, and alphabets and, 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 and so on. And many, many uh, writing systems even have different encodings. So kind of on this system, you're using that encoding. On that system, you're using that other encoding. Even simple encodings like, like, um, like the Western European languages, uh, the extended uh, ASCII character, sets, uh, they are slightly different depending on, on, uh, on which platform you are on. Uh, for example, if you're on Windows, some specific characters are encoded slightly differently than if you are on, on, on Mac or, or a Unix uh, Linux machine. Um, the tricky bit there is that it's only a, just, I think it's, it's two or three code points that are different, and all the others are the same. So how do you detect, like, 
okay, I've got this document, uh, whether it's this encoding or that. Um, we have a couple of tricks for that, um, but let's, let's go through um, a neat class that we have for, for doing these kinds of detection. It's called the text statistics. It's part of the text detector class uh, in Tika. You can use it also as a standalone component. Uh, just, just forget about the tech, uh, normal Tika detectors. Just use these text statistics, and you can do pretty, pretty kind of um, advanced uh, detection. So how it works, um, it basically looks only at the bytes of the document. It doesn't care about basically anything. It doesn't try to detect characters or anything like that. It just computes the frequency of different bytes. And since there are only uh, 256 different bytes uh, that, that are possible, like we only have a, like a fixed length um, array for, for these frequencies. So how you use it, you add the data to it, um, like you can stream, uh, uh, get the data from a stream or then just, just have one, one array with, with all your data. You can just use a header or a kind of a prefix of, of, your, of a larger document and it still works reasonably well. And some methods that, that give you like the counts of, of how many bytes you counted and then how many, uh, what's the frequency of this specific byte and so on. And there's a couple of convenience methods that we use uh, currently in the text detector to detect like whether this looks like ASCII, uh, which is kind of, okay, there might be some control characters. It's fine if there's just one or two within, within the first kilobyte of the document, and, and there might be some high order bits uh, or high order bytes, but if they're like a minority, then it's reasonably certain that we're dealing with ASCII or an ASCII-based format like, like the I ISO. Uh, 8859 ones. Another one is UTF-8. Uh, the the UTF-8 en encoding is fairly easy to detect automatically. Uh, we can use heuristics to, to, to detect. At least we can say for sure whether it's not UTF-8. And then kind of whether it's, it's UTF-A or, or plain ASCII, it's, it's, that might be a little bit trickier to determine. Uh, but most of the time it's pretty clear like if, if it looks like UTF-8, then it, then it most likely is. But as I said, this, this class can do a lot more. Um, it's just, just not hooked in through the rest of Tika yet, so you have to do it yourself. So to show how you could use this class, um, I took uh, different translations of a kind of a pretty universal document. This is the, uh, the Universal Decla Declaration of, of uh, Human Rights from the United Nations. Uh, it's translated to, to hundreds of languages. Here uh, are the byte frequencies of the UTF-8 uh, encoding of that document in the six, uh, six uh, official languages of the United Nations. So we have English, we have French, Spanish. They all look reasonably similar. Then we have Arabic, that's already quite different, Chinese and Russian. Uh, and by looking at this, this chart, you could all, all already tell that, okay, I could be fairly certain by looking just at this, this kind of a graph uh, of any document in these languages that, okay, if it looks a lot like this, then it's probably something like Chinese or at least uh, closely related. Um, if it looks like this, then it's probably one of the, the ASCII-based uh, encodings. Uh, what we see here is, is here's the range for um, the capital alphabets from A to C, and here's the range for, for, for the lowercase uh, alphabets uh, A to Z. So of course, like the lowercase characters are, are much more frequent than, than the uppercase ones. This spike here, it's the space character, um, and it also shows up here in these other languages. It's used for white space. Uh, but the interesting thing is that like here, the number of spaces is pretty constant. It's about, uh, it's about 15% of, of all, um, all character, all, all bytes in the document. But here, depending on the language, like in Arabic, there are, aren't that many spaces. Uh, in Chinese, there's a lot of them. Um, I'm actually not sure why they encode the space there, but uh, they do. Um, and in Russian, uh, it's kind of a, in the middle there. Uh, so the words are longer. Um, and so on. 
Um, and then if you want to kind of, okay, we could uh, use this mechanism to detect these kind of different types of alphabets. But if we want to kind of determine like, okay, try to figure out whether this is English, French, or Spanish, we could take one of these languages as the baseline and then do diff against uh, the statistics of that or, or the histogram of that. So now we have French and Spanish compared to English. So now you start seeing a little bit differences here. Um, um, you can certainly tell that, okay, this doesn't look like English because then if it's English, then you'd have like minor variation in here. Uh, so it's some different language. Um, and there are some, some like, like high, high bit, uh, bytes here, here. Um, some uh, bytes that are not used in normal uh, English. So, so these uh, use the extended character encoding. And then um, if you had enough data, like a big enough file, uh, then uh, these uh, frequencies become uh, statistically significant and you can actually use that, just these byte counts to determine what's, what is the language uh, that the document is in and what is the most likely uh, encoding uh, that, that the document is in. So <clears throat> that's pretty neat. Um, and, uh, and then kind of you can use the same thing also kind of to detect these different encodings. So, so far we only looked at UTF-8 encodings. Um, here's the same languages like the, the non-European languages. Um, here's Arabic uh, encoded in UTF-8 and the same thing in UTF-16. It looks quite a, quite a bit different. Um, you can see that it's kind of, um, in UTF-8 uh, most of the characters will be, will be in, in, in kind of two or three bytes uh, encoding, so kind of the high bit is set there and then just a couple of, of spaces and, and probably some numbers here um, around the, the byte 50. Uh, but most of them are in the, the high bit range. Um, but in, when we look at UTF-16, we have some, uh, like, uh, quite a few bytes that are just zero. Um, that's probably all of these. And then the second byte is here. Um, and then um, a few others uh, in this range and the rest uh, here pretty, uh, um, a lot more uh, uniformly distributed in the, in the high bit range than what you see here. So it's, it's fairly easy to kind of look at this, this kind of a graph and tell whether you're dealing with something in UTF-8 or UTF-16. Um, and then there's this kind of language specific encodings. Uh, this is Chinese um, in UTF-8. And this is the same thing in, in EUC, CN, um, a kind of uh, encoding that, that's um, customized for, for Chinese. Um, and again, we see that, okay, it borrows the same, same ASCII uh, characters for, for those, those parts, uh, but then kind of the distribution here is, is again, uh, quite a bit more um, uniform than uh, in, in the UTF-8 encoding that kind of uh, maps uh, the different uh, byte sequences into different specific ranges, uh, which also makes UTF-8 fairly easy to, to detect uh, automatically. Um, here, like we see, but again, this is somewhat easy to, to detect now uh, since we know that, okay, these are the ranges to look at. And if you have a histogram with, with the bump in here, then it most likely isn't uh, in this encoding. Or if it is, then it, it prob probably is, is not Chinese uh, encoded in that, that encoding. Um, again, uh, Russian, we see a similar pattern here. Uh, this is the KOI-8R um, encoding. Again, uh, they use the same low, low ASCII bits and then um, kind of a pretty tight tight bump there at the specific range of, of characters. So even though these aren't like, like really super accurate, they still give you a, a kind of a, a fairly good idea, especially if you have, have, have more data and you can kind of start to make uh, statistically 
significant inferences on, on, on these encodings. So that's something that I've done uh, on a couple of cases, and it's worked fairly well. Uh, it unfortunately hasn't, hasn't ended up in Tika yet, uh, but that's kind of on the to-do list to kind of make it a standard part. Uh, but you can al already do that with, with the text statistics class. Um, then another uh, related detection mechanism, like if you have this kind of just a short amount of, of, of text, uh, you already figured out that, okay, it's, it looks like UTF-8 or it looks like ASCII, but I have so little data that I can't really determine the language it's in. Um, then we can use this language identifier mechanism. It's based on n-grams, so it basically takes the sequences of characters. Uh, in Tika, we use three uh, characters per each sequence. Uh, and then we calculate the frequencies of those n grams or three grams in, in, in Tika. Uh, so basically what you do, uh, you work a little bit like, uh, like with the text stat statistics, but instead of counting individual bytes, you count these, these n grams. And as a result, uh, you get a, it's, it's kind of a histogram, but since there are so, so many uh, potential um, n-grams. Um, it's, we rather call it a profile and kind of just use a, a very sparse mapping of, of those, those frequencies. And then um, we calculate the distance of that profile to those of, of known existing languages. So we have kind of generated these profiles for, for common, uh, mostly European languages where this mechanism is, is pretty pretty useful. Um, and then if we find that, okay, this profile matches pretty well with one of these known, known uh, language profiles, then, then we're fairly certain that, that this is the language uh, we're, we're seeing here. And the nice thing about this is that kind of you could even like uh, send hello world to this detector and it'll tell that it's English. Or you could sell uh, bonjour to it and it'll tell that it's in French. So that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, just to give you an idea of what these, these n-grams look like, uh, here's the topmost frequent uh, three grams uh, that Tika is using. The underscore here means that there's a, a break between words. So we, in, in addition to just, just counting the characters that, that make up the words, uh, we always lowercase them to keep things, things simple. Uh, we also count these, these word breaks. So that could be any punctuation, like there could be uh, a period, a comma, um, a white space, line, line breaks or stuff like that. They all get compacted to just this underscore. So for English, as you know, the is the most common thing you see it in all text uh, over and over again. So we have like something that starts with it and then the word itself and then the end of it uh, come up uh, fairly frequently. And then there's, uh, ends of word. There's a lot of words uh, in English that end in ion or on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. And, uh, and the same thing for, for different languages. If you know these languages, they start to look somewhat familiar. You, you can come up fairly easily with words that, that uh, in French lob end with s. Uh, um, or, or this, <laughs> uh, in this case, um, words that end in NT, uh, that's a pretty common pattern, and so on. And of course, if you're dealing with Russian, you, they, they have their own uh, uh, alphabet, so it's, it's fairly straightforward to detect that, uh, even without, um, without um, the, this mechanism of, of detecting the uh, kind of the language based on, on the characters. But in some cases, when you're not exactly sure about um, the encoding, um, then you might try like different encodings and try whether it matches really well this specific uh, language profile when interpreted in this encoding. So, so sometimes that works. Um. Okay, that's enough about uh, detection. Um, and, and encodings and stuff. Um, let's look a little bit 
uh, deeper into the media types. Nick will probably kind of cover this uh, also uh, in his talk, um, but this is kind of, I'll try to go a little bit deeper into the actual kinds of media types that we see out there in the world. So this is the basic standard for, for, for media types or the format of a media type. So you start with the type and the subtype, uh, text plane or application PDF and so on, and then you can have any number of parameters add, added to it, for example, text plane, char set, UTF-8, and so on. That's supposedly a very simple format. Um, unfortunately, people get it wrong all the time. So these are like, like well-formed um, media types. But then you start seeing like, okay, sometimes the, the attributes are duplicated uh, or they're malformed. Sometimes there's extra characters here. Uh, this is actually a fairly common pattern. Um, some, some web servers like to, to serve content by putting the character encoding first and then, then the type and subtype at the end. I have no idea why they do that, but <laughs> they do it. So, um, Quite a lot of applications just kind of use basically string comparisons for this stuff. Like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with, with some kind of a, a content type. I'm do downloading a, a file from the web or I have an email attachment that comes with a, a content type. And then I just check that, okay, if, if it's uh, an image uh, PNG, then it's gonna be a PNG image. Um, or if it's uh, text HTML, then it's gonna be an HTML document. Um, but unfortunately, that, that fails quite often uh, when you deal with these kinds of anomalies. So what we have in Tika, we have this media type class that encodes a lot of these, these, uh, the standard rules as well as the common ways in which those rules are being broken. So you can give it uh, a string that you kind of expect to contain uh, some kind of a media type. Uh, and, and this parse uh, method will do its best to kind of figure out uh, what, what, uh, what is really being intended uh, with that string. For, uh, for a human user, these are all obvious, like what they mean, but for a computer without like, like a help from, from a utility class like this, it's, it's pretty hard. So, um, <clears throat> so once you've parsed a media type, um, and kind of you have it in a nice, nice uh, format, uh, it, it's cleaned up, uh, you can do, do checks on it, like okay, give me the, the main type, the subtype, give me these parameters that, that are there, or check whether there are any parameters and so on. Um, but still it might not give you enough information about what you can do with that document. So you need to start like, like interpreting that, that information. So for example, if I have something that's image anything, it, it's going to be some sort of an image and I could start uh, like an image viewer or, or uh, display it on screen. Um, so that, that's simple enough. You could do just like a prefix check on, on the media type. Um, okay, if it's image or starts with image last, then okay, I'm gonna start my image viewer application for that. Um, However, if you want to do something different with it, uh, if you want to kind of get all your documents and, and, and try to parse XML content out of them, for example, you're, you're looking for a specific, uh, um, say, say, links within the documents that are encoded in, in, in um, XML, or you want to look for, for, for Dublin Core metadata attributes uh, encoded as, as XML at, uh, attributes and so on, you want to know that, okay, you, you want to be able to check whether this detected content type uh, is something that can be interpreted as XML. And that's already get, gets a little bit complicated. Here's a hint, like, that this is plus XML. Uh, and you could use a suffix check for that. Uh, but kind of not all of the media types do that. So it gets a bit complicated. Um, it would be nice if we could do this uh, and tell that, okay, like whichever document I have, I want to check whether I can use an XML parser on it 
um, without breaking things or kind of getting errors or trying to kind of using up resources unnecessarily. <clears throat> or um, you might want to know like whether it's, it's kind of, I don't have any fancy parsers or anything. I just want to know like whether this is text. So I could run it through a full text indexer, for example, that'll just pick up any, any words that are in there. Uh, an SVG image will contain a lot of numbers, numbers and still more numbers, but it'll probably also contain all the strings that are uh, included in that image. It'll contain all the links that are included in the image. It will contain pot potential metadata that, that's attached that, that to the image. So if you just knew that this kind of a document is plain text, uh, you wouldn't have to worry. You could just kind of uh, uh, send it to, to the indexer and get reasonable uh, information out of it. And finally, uh, to kind of make the inheritance tree complete, uh, it is fairly simple to know that, OK, if, if all else, else fails, we can always treat the, the, the type as a kind of a unstructured sequence of bytes. Uh, that's the octet stream uh, media type. And there's, there isn't very, very many useful things you can do with that. Uh, you could count the bytes or <laughs> try, to, try to do stuff like that. There's some cases, like for example, the XMP standard has a way of, of encoding XMP uh, snippets within arbitrary uh, byte streams. They have this uh, specific prefix and suffix patterns that you can scan through the document and, and detect that, okay, now this part of this unknown byte stream looks like XMP, and I'm gonna interpret that even though I don't know anything about the, the rest of the document. But kind of, there you don't need fancy type, type checking to know that, okay, I can do something like this. So um, having something like this, this would be useful uh, for, for many cases. And luckily, we do implement that in Tika. Uh, and that's actually used uh, within the parser uh, framework quite a lot. Like the detection uh, gives you a media type, but not, there isn't necessarily a parser that's targeting just that specific media type. So then we'll kind of walk up the type hierarchy and figure out like whether there's some other parser that that will uh, interpret this whole class of documents. So um, the key to this, this functionality is the media type registry. Um, it's a class that's based on the information in the in Tika's uh, uh, MIME types uh, XML file, plus some custom heuristics. And the way you use it, uh, you first parse the string that you got from somewhere, so you get a clean, clean type. Uh, there's a normalization uh, step. Uh, basically, you can have uh, aliases to, to existing uh, media types. So um, the, the normalization just simplifies that we're always dealing with the canonical uh, names of the types. And well, the first thing was simple. We just check whether it's the main type is image. Um, and then uh, we use this is instance of uh, that kind of applies to more complicated typing rules. Uh, so we check that, okay, whether this type that we got here is an instance of XML um, or if it's instance of, of plain text. Uh, and then if it is, then, then we know what to do with that document. That works pretty well in practice. So here are the current rules that we have. Uh, First, the aliases are just mapped. Uh, here's an example of an alias that's kind of an older one. Uh, nowadays, the standard one for, for Photoshop files is, is using this uh, DND uh, syntax. Um, the X media types are like extensions uh, that are not officially uh, registered. So it's kind of whenever you don't see something like that, it's kind of, okay, someone just started using it, but there's no no standard behind it uh, necessarily. Um, we get rid of all these uh, parameters. Uh, so kind of, you can always tell that, okay, something with extra parameters is, is an instance of, of, of the base type. Uh, also in the Tika, uh, MIME types uh, XML file that contains the registry of, of this type information, we can encode 
this subclass of uh, uh, details. So we can tell there's an entry in this file for video, og, that tells that this media type is really a subtype of the more generic og application container uh, type. So if you have an application that can deal with any og files, for example, just, just break it up and use the individual components, um, then, and then if you're, you're given a video, uh, OG video, then you can know that you can still, still send that uh, document to this, this parser. Uh, then we have these special suffixes, um, and we just, just use uh, heuristics for that. Uh, nowadays, we probably should add uh, plus JSON to that set, because those media types are getting more common. Um, text, anything is always a text plain document. And then finally, anything is, is an octet stream. That works pretty well nowadays. Uh, um, when some of new rules come up, we just add and extend this, this set. Um, most of the time, it, it, involves, it involves adding this subclass of entries uh, in the MIME types documents. OK, so um, let's move on to a different topic, um, metadata. And XMP metadata, more specifically. Um, if you're familiar with Tika, you know that okay, you can get these, these uh, key value pairs of metadata, uh, and you have some, some constants that define uh, the different uh, metadata keys that you can use. Um, um, it works pretty well for simple applications, um, but for more complicated stuff, um, like, like if you're dealing with um, uh, uh, use cases like, like digital asset management or a kind of high-end uh, publishing workflows where you want to keep track of very complicated uh, and very detailed metadata about, about the documents that you're dealing with, um, then um, it becomes uh, like the, the key value pair idea that we have in, in, the, in normal metadata in Tika is, becomes very limiting. Uh, for example, uh, Here's uh, an example of the XMP uh, sequence. That's uh, to a degree can be uh, simulated with TICAS like multi-value metadata entries. But in XMP, you could also have like language attributes to this sequence or kind of have an alternate sequence, like for example, a title in, in four different languages. Uh, and one of them is marked as the default. And that's something that, that's very hard to do uh, with the normal metadata. But that, that's fairly common in, in, in kind of more, more advanced uh, uh, asset workflows. So we've started doing that in Tika. Uh, there's a separate XMP component that extends uh, the metadata mechanism in Tika. You can access it for just to play around it, with it with the XMP um, argument to, to Tika app. Um, and instead of printing out the normal key value pairs uh, um, as, as metadata, it'll, it'll kind of do a valid uh, XML encoding of, of the XMP data uh, that it finds. And it looks a little bit like this. Uh, there are, um, like I've seen documents that have like um, hundreds of kilobytes of XMP metadata and that's not even including binaries that you can include in the my metadata. Uh, typically, you'd include thumbnails and stuff like that in the XMP. But even just plain strings and numbers and stuff like that, that's kind of, for example, um, it's often used for, for um, videos to kind of encode extra information that, OK, in this specific frame, we have these specific uh, elements appear. And so you have like a big sequence of frames uh, encoded in the XMP and all have like a very, very complicated metadata associated with it. So that, that would be practically impossible to do with, with Tika, uh, with the standard metadata. So how this is implemented, uh, we have the normal uh, metadata class in Tika core. Um, in the separate component called Tika XMP, we've extended uh, the metadata class uh, call it the XMP metadata. And it basically implements or inherits and implements all of the 
functionality in the normal metadata. So you could basically just plug it in um, into, into the normal um, parser uh, um, pipeline and have it work without problems. But then if you have a custom parser, uh, which we still don't have within Tika itself, that understands this extended XMP metadata, then they can kind of add this additional information as well. And the way this works and the way why we are putting this stuff in a separate component is that uh, instead of implementing the XMP standard ourselves, we actually use a separate library for that. It's called XMP Core. And it's a, well, it's not a huge library, but it's still, um, it, it's still considerable. Uh, it's still larger than Tika itself. So, <laughs> so that's why we didn't want to put this inside Tika Core, but rather put it in a separate uh, pluggable um, component. And this XMP meta object uh, is exposed by this class. So you can um, either in a parser, you can check like, okay, whether I have XMP metadata given to me. And if I have, I can access the actual XMP meta uh, object from, from that. Um, and then, then inject direct uh, XMP information there. Or if I'm just a normal parser that doesn't understand more, the more complex stuff, I'm gonna use the standard metadata uh, methods like set, uh, set date and set string uh, and so on. And then the XMP metadata class will do the translation automatically and then write them to the correct places within the XMP document. So <clears throat> that's useful for some cases, um, though um, unless you're dealing with these kinds of very more complex stuff, um, it, it, it's normally not, not, not needed, but, but pretty useful when you do, do need that stuff. Um, later on, it might be that this, kind of, this stuff gets integrated more tightly into uh, normal Tika, especially once we get around to kind of um, adding um, more complex metadata support to the standard parsers. Uh, and the key use case for doing that is, is to, to be able to, to have thumbnails uh, as a part of the metadata. So if you have an image, it would be really nice if instead of just the just, uh, the, the string values that are encoded in the image uh, and, 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 and meta information like, like the width and height of, of the image, you could also have a, like a small, uh, a few kilobytes uh, worth of a thumbnail of the image there. Uh, and then you could store that uh, in, in a kind of a, along with the metadata of the image and make it efficiently accessible. And that, that might be a case where we do need uh, the XMP stuff to make that, that work well. But we'll see what happens with that. Another nice feature um, that, that's related to the structured text that, that Tika parsers provide is link extraction. So um, as you probably know, Tika produce or the parsers produce XHTML. They try to take the source document and encode uh, the information, the structural information in the document as uh, XHTML. So if I know that, okay, this one is a heading within this document, uh, then I'm gonna to do a heading tag and put that text in, in that tag. Uh, if this is a paragraph, I'm gonna do a paragraph tag and so on. And if there are links in the source document, I'm gonna do an XHTML link um, or other type of a uh, reference, like image reference or, or uh, object reference or stuff like that. And, uh, and so they appear uh, in the output as, as normal XHTML. Um, though typically when you do, um, do process these documents, you just kind of write it out somewhere. You might just, just be interested in the text, so you just extract the text and then throw away the XHTML or then you just serialize it into a, a big file um, that just contains everything. And then if you want to get the links back, um, if you uh, extracted just the text, then you're out of luck. If you, you wrote it into to an XHTML file, then you have to reparse the document, which isn't that, 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 that nice, especially if you have to deal with, with uh, millions of documents. So the link content handler comes in pretty handy, uh, 
handy here. It's basically uh, something that you can add to an existing uh, parsing pipeline. So you have your normal content handler that takes care of, like extracts just the text or, or serializes the output or, or does whatever you like. Um, and then you can add a uh, link content handler, handler along with it. Uh, there's a separate content handler co class called the T content handler that basically takes the sax event sequence and sends it to this content handler and then another one and possibly any number of, of handlers. So you can kind of uh, demux the, the, the sequence of, of content that's coming out of the parser. And what the link content handler does, um, it looks at the XHTML that's coming out, and it detects that, okay, here's, here I have a link, here I have a link, here I have an image, or here I have an object that references some external content. And then I just keep, keep a record of those, just those pieces of content. And, uh, and then later on, once the document is parsed, I can ask the link content handler, okay, what were the links that you saw? And this is what it looks like uh, in code. Um, so we create the link on the handler, pass it to the parser. Here I'm only interested in the links, so I don't have any other content handlers here. And then uh, afterwards I just do get links, and I get a sequence of, of all the links and other references that were in the document. And then I could store them in, in a database uh, for, for later access, or if I do a, a web crawler, uh, I could kind of then, then put them in the queue of, of documents to be crawled next and so on. Um, the reason why this is so useful uh, beyond just those use cases is that you can use the same pattern also for other types of, of information that you want to pick out of the document. Um, uh, for example, these microformats are, are a good, good idea to do that. Um, for example, there, there are, um, there's a way to encode uh, coordinates within an HTML document, you could say that, okay, this, this image uh, is, is about this area of the world or, or this paragraph uh, or this section of the page is about this, this area of the world. Or you could encode that, okay, this, this part of the document is about this specific person or this specific event or, or date or so on. And you can have that semantic information associated with um, with the document, and if the parser supports that, uh, currently it's only really, really useful for 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 the HTML parser, um, where you can get those those uh, bits out through. But but later on, we could add similar stuff also to like the PDF parser or or, or the other kinds of parsers, uh, like the NetCDF parser. Uh, seems like a good idea for for such a use case. Use case. And then you could use the exact same pattern. And just instead of have a link content handler, you could have like a coordinate uh, or a geo content handler or a person content handler that just extracts all those bits out of the document as, as it comes out of the parser. So much about that. Um, another nice feature uh, for specific use cases is the fork parser. Um, the use case for, for this feature is that, that kind of sometimes uh, the parser libraries that you use to parse a document, is, this used to be true for, for PDF box uh, on older Java versions. It could just crash horribly. Like I, I've seen a number of cases where the entire JVM will crash because I'm trying to parse a PDF. Um, and then my entire application is gone and there's no exception or anything, it just dies. Yeah, or it could, yeah, it could get stuck, it could run out of memory, it, anything could happen. And there's not, not, not much you can do since the only time you can really detect that something like that is going to be happening if you already have parsed the document. But since you're only sending that document to the parser, there isn't that much you can do. So what the fork parser does is uh, it guards or creates sandboxes by essentially forking the JVM, creating a new JVM instance. Um, and that's a little bit tricky thing to do. Uh, in practice, how we do this uh, is, like, if the user starts, uh, okay, I have a document, let's par I want you to parse it. 
what the fork parser does, uh, since it's like you can't just call fork on the JVM instance that you are running, uh, and we wanted this mechanism to work so that you don't have to explicitly um, configure things again and again, so that, okay, like if you want to do, you start this process and that process and figure out how to start the JVM and so on. Uh, instead, the fork parser will create a temporary directory, write a couple of uh, class files in it, uh, and then figure out where the JVM is or the Java runtime is, uh, start it based on that temporary directory, and initialize the class that we wrote there. Uh, it's called the fork server, and then it sends uh, this delegate parser. It serializes this parser, sends it to that, that JVM, which then figures out that, okay, I don't have the class files to actually unserialize that. So what this fork server then does, it's, it's integrated into this special uh, class loader. It says that, okay, hey, fork parser, I can't unserialize this class. You need to give me uh, more class files. And then the fork parser will send the class files here, write them in here, and then uh, we're able to, to deserialize the parser. Um, and once that's done, we have a full copy of whichever parser we're using here. It could be the, the auto-detect parser uh, and all the composite uh, parsers that there are, and all the parser libraries and everything that you're accessing uh, could get sent to that uh, slave. And after that's done, uh, we send the actual document, and then uh, the parsing starts here, and it starts sending the XHTML events back it starts sending the metadata back and so on. And to the user, this is all transparent. It works. It, it looks desperate. It felt desperate when we did this, but it works really smoothly. Uh, yeah. Um, the nice thing is that, that all the, the communication is streamed. Um, so kind of most of the time, in any case, is going into the parser instead of like, m moving bytes around. So uh, typically, the, the performance impact isn't that, that bad. And what we also do, uh, the fork parser will keep a pool of, of, of a couple of, of slave JVMs around. So if you have a lot of concurrent uh, clients uh, parsing documents at the same time, even if one of them gets stuck, the other documents can still be parsed mm -hmm. concurrently. So that's a scary thing to use, but it's really neat uh, when you get it working. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. It's it's essentially a custom uh, protocol that we just like when we start the new JVM we get handles to the standard input and standard output of, of that JVM. And then we just, just uh, essentially use a custom protocol to send this information back and forth. Yeah, what, what happens is if, if, uh, if one of these uh, JVMs is, is gets into a wrong state, um, it could be, most likely it is that it runs out of memory or, or it crashes or something like that. Or it could be that there's some bug in this communication or something like that happens. Uh, then what we do here, we just detect that, okay, within a given amount of time, we got no response back from there. Then we just, okay, we close that, those streams, and we tell the cli client that, okay, something happened. We throw an exception for that specific document. And then we forget about that JVM. And here in the fork server, we have a watchdog process that listens, keeps track of all the communication with the, the main master process. And if nothing has happened within uh, the last minute, it automatically click, kills out the slave. So you don't have, end up with lots of zombie processes in the background. Yeah.
Right. So, so if, if something did, did fail here, um, the fork server is, 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 is smart enough to know that if, if there's an exception or kind of some, some detectable uh, error here, uh, then, it, then it will serialize that exception and send it to here, and where it will then, then get, be unserialized and then and, and delivered to, to, the, to the user. Um, if there's something more serious, like the entire JVM crashes, or, or something like that happens, uh, then the only thing we can tell from here is that, okay, now at some point we got no response from, from there. And then we just throw an ex generic exception that something bad happened, I don't know what, and that information is essentially lost uh, then. Currently, there's no mechanism of logging these live JVMs. Yeah, it's, yeah, 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 that, that might be a neat addition to here. Um, basically, so far, like, like the use cases where this has been used is like, if some of the documents can't be parsed or something happens, then we don't really care. Uh, what we do actually uh, in those cases, we just, just detect that whatever exception happened, we we log it or we throw it away, and no one really looks at that. But what we do instead is we kind of uh, keep a full text index of, of the documents. And, and, and whenever something happened during the parser, there was an abnormal termination. Uh, we store a specific custom string in the search index. So we can later go back and search for that specific keyword and find all the documents that we couldn't parse, and then we can go back and get the original document, look at them in more, more detail. Um, and then when you try to parse them again, then typically you'll either succeed or then you get the original error message again. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. So then you can go, go back later on and figure out what, what went wrong. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, I think we're running out of time. Um, there's a couple of, of small tricks in, in Tika app. These aren't that, that's, that big things. Uh, you can use Tika app as an as encoding converter. Um, if you don't have the icon uh, program or some other mechanism for that available, you can use it to tie the HTML. <laughs> it's not, not ideal, but sometimes it's just kind of, okay, I got this huge mess of a document. I just want to get the basic stuff out of it. Um, I find myself using that every now and then. Um, and the last bit, uh, if you don't know about it, try it. It's the Tika GUI. Uh, you start it like this, and it starts this, this uh, um, graphical uh, window, and then you just take files and drop on top of it. And if Tika can't parse it, it will throw an exception, and you get the details there. If it can't parse it, you'll get all of the, the information, the metadata, the text output, the HTML output, and all that stuff. Very easy to use. That's it. We're actually out of time in the session, so if anyone needs to take off, but uh, I believe the next speaker isn't here today. Or is anyone in here the next speaker? No? So I guess if you have to run, you can, but uh, do yeah, actually, I, I'm, I'm unable to stick around since I have a next talk in five minutes. <laughs> so thanks all.